COVID-19 has reshaped globalization and further strained Sino-American relations. How will this influence China's role in the Middle East and the wider Mediterranean region? The China Med Tel Aviv University China in the Mid Med series looks at this dynamic in conversation with leading global voices. Look at the world of tomorrow. Join the China in the Mid Med series. Morning and welcome to the China Med Tel Aviv University China in the Mid Med series, a series of webinars that look at how current global dynamic will impact China's future role in the Middle East and in the wider Mediterranean region. My name is Enrico Fardella. I'm a professor at Peggy University, and in this capacity, I direct the Center for Mediterranean Area Studies and the China Med project. Next to me are virtually sitting my colleagues and co host of this program. Uh, Professor Ori Sela, Chair of the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University, and Professor Brandon Friedman, Director of Research at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle East and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. Today, I'm proud to welcome a renowned scholar, one of the most prominent global voices on Sino American relations, my esteemed colleague, Professor Jia Ching Wu. Professor Jia is a professor and former dean of the School of International Studies of Peking University and a member of the Standing Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 1988 and spent several years working abroad teaching in the uh, University of Vermont, Cornell University, University of California, San Diego, and University of Sydney. Thank you very much for being with us, Chinguo, and thank you for accepting our invitation today. Thank you. So, uh, Today, we would like to analyze uh, with you uh, the logic that um, animates the rising tensions in Sino American relations and how these might impact the future of uh, China and the Middle East and in the wider Mediterranean region. Let's begin from the past. Uh, the rationale for uh, Sino American relations since uh, Deng's reform and opening was based on US support of China's modernization and China's participation in the existing US-led international order. In recent years, something has progress progressively destabilized this equilibrium, and China's modernization has been perceived more and more as a threat to the existing order. Now, China's international stance has always been uh, merely uh, anti-hegemonic, and this might lead us to infer that uh, its modernization could not be, by definition, compatible with a US-led order. So, do you think that the West somehow misinterpreted the logic of China modernization uh, since the very beginning, or has something changed along the way in China modernization to challenge the previous equilibrium? Well, I think uh, the U.S. has been rather successful uh, in encouraging China to uh, rejoin uh, the international system. Uh, after the early 1970s. Uh, China uh, has become part of the international system, has played a more and more uh, active and or proactive role in the system, and has become a stakeholder of the system. Uh, uh, in fact, it has been so successful that its influence uh, is uh, has grown to the extent that the uh, some Americans find it very difficult to put up with. Uh, um, it's like you welcome China to join the Olymp Olympic game, and Chinese athletes are, per are performing so well that you are not getting all the you know uh, first prizes. Uh, you feel upset and angry. <laughs> How can you do this to us? Uh, but of course, uh, uh, China has not uh, become the uh, the country that the U.S. Uh, 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 well, many Americans hope uh, that it will come will become. Uh, it has become 
a market-oriented country. It has become a country that subscribes to rule of law and all these nice things. But at the same time, it has remained quite different uh, from uh, the, the Western uh, democracies, uh, as we would like to put it. Um, uh, China still has uh, one party, uh, one ruling party, and uh, it's, it has its own way to conduct politics and business. Um, it has not changed uh, to the extent that uh, many Americans have uh, wished and expected. That's why they are, uh, that added to their frustration. <laughs> I mean, uh, at least some people, some parties uh, frustration in the U.S. Some others are frustrated uh, that China has been so successful, uh, you know, just for that fact. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, if I, uh, you think that is uh, uh, the frustration is based on uh, um, on what on the fact that China has been. Um, that they misunderstood uh, the possibility to make China's modernization compatible with the um, with the U.S. international system. There are different. So there was, is there, there was there was there a level of misunderstanding? That's what, I'm, what I'm, I would like to know. Was there a level of you think that was they got it wrong or something changed along the way in China's you know uh, interaction with the international system? It's rather complicated. Uh, actually, um, first of all, uh, there are many groups in the U.S. They look at China from different perspectives. Okay? One group uh, uh, is what we call uh, containers. <laughs> from the very beginning, they believe, to, they believe in power politics. Uh, they believe that any uh, rise of China poses a direct threat to the US. Okay. So they interpret everything that China does from that perspective. So when China tries to defend its uh, uh, territorial interests, uh, maritime interests in the South China Sea, they see this as a uh, first step of Chinese external expansion as a result of China's rise. And then there are people who uh, what I call believe, uh, are, contain, are engagement people. Uh, the engagement people, you have three kinds at least. The first kind are those moderate realists. They believe that uh, as China grows and get integrated with the international uh, system, China becomes, uh, has acquired more and more stakes in the, in the system. So China has become stakeholders as uh, uh, Bob Zelik, uh, the former De uh, uh, you know, uh, Vice Secretary of uh, State, uh, is, is put it. Uh, so they believe that China and the U.S. can have increasing room to, to co collaborate uh, on the basis of shared interests. And then there are people uh, who uh, approach China from a, from a value perspective. <laughs> so they... Uh, you know, they want to push China in the direction of liberal democracy. Uh, they hope, uh, they believe, they used to believe that as China develops, as China becomes more integrated with the outside world, China will become, a lib will become more liberal, if not democratic. Okay? And recently, uh, this group of people <laughs> became quite upset. <laughs> China has not developed to the extent <laughs> Uh, well, has not changed the extent uh, as they have uh, had wished, uh, and also in the direction as they had used, uh, they had uh, they used to expect. And then there are a third group of engagement people. Uh, these are the business people, uh, with mostly multinationals. Okay, they used to to be strong supporters of engagement policy um, because their interests. Uh, they have huge stakes in, in economic relations with China. And this group of people have, uh, re in recent years, have a lot of complaints about Chinese <laughs> government's policy uh, toward uh, foreign companies. They think that they, they have been discriminated uh, because of, you know, in terms of market, market access, intellectual property rights, 
and all these kinds of things. So, uh, you know, all these three groups of people of engagement, they are disappointed with China one way or the other. Uh, uh, they are no longer, uh, uh, they are quite disappointed. Either they, are, they don't uh, voice uh, their opinion anymore, or, or they, uh, they, are, um, uh, they are so disappointed that they, they believe that uh, they sh you know, the US should adopt a tough policy to, to change China rather than the soft policy as used to, used to take. So you have uh, the, the, the containment people prevail at the moment. Uh, uh, the engagement people, uh, some support uh, more, more tougher policy on China. Uh, others uh, don't voice their opinion anymore. Uh, so as a result, you see this uh, consensus, uh, Washington consensus on China. Okay. Basically, the consensus is about toughness on China. Uh, it's not... Uh, you know they differ in terms of uh, in terms of uh, tactics. They differ in terms of goals, but but they share one one uh, 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 view that is uh, we need to be tough on China. And very few people are saying no, no, no. This is not a good strategy. If I may, um, you know, a couple of decades ago, Professor Jonathan Spence from Yale wrote a, a book called uh, To Change China. And in that uh, book, he was, uh, he's a, a, an historian, of course, and uh, he was uh, sketching the ways in which uh, different, uh, mainly Westerners, but also Russians, uh, came to China from the 19th century, or uh, actually from the uh, beginning of the Qing dynasty with the Jesuits and later the Protestants, and then the communists, and each of them tried to change China so that China would fit their own view of what China should be like. Um, uh, one of the conclusions from that book is that most of them failed. Uh, China changed, but China changed itself in its own way and through its own agenda and, and system. Now, you were talking about, for example, that group that talks about uh, the, the, the values. Um, and uh, we also saw in the recent um, White House document uh, the discussion about uh, one of the challenges that uh, China um, uh, brings to the U.S., which is the, the challenge of values, right? Um, so um, the U.S. presents its own values as they are presented in the U.S. Constitution and so on and so forth. Um, it seems that the Chinese value system that is perhaps, I'm not sure, uh, the one that is supposed to compete with that American value system is less clear, especially to the outside world. Now, I, I'm wondering if you can elaborate about this kind of, uh, what is standing opposite to this so-called liberal democracy value system from the Chinese side? What is um, what comes to mind, perhaps, is uh, I think that was uh, Enrico's question, and I'm kind of <laughs> taking over. Um, uh, is of course the Chinese dream, the notion of the Chinese dream that President Xi has been promoting since, uh, especially since November uh, 2012. And perhaps we can get a better grasp of what types of values are standing opposite to one another, if at all they are in opposition. Well, if you look at uh, China, does have a uh, Chinese government does come up with, uh, uh, you know, a twenty-four character uh, set of values, uh, core values of China. <laughs> uh, socialist core values, uh, they are called. Okay, and those core values include democracy, freedom, rule of law. <laughs> All these uh, sound very familiar to uh, people in the West. You know. uh, of course, we also have harmony, which is harm, uh, you know, harmless <laughs> to, uh, to Americans too. Uh, uh, so I've always argued that uh, after years of change uh, since, the, since uh, China's adoption of openness and reforms, China has changed so much that uh, you know, at the ideational level or conceptual level, 
we don't have different set of values from the West. Yeah. It's at the level of practice that they are, we are, we are quite different. Okay. Um, for example, rule of law, you know, uh, China has made a lot of progress, but uh, it's far from enough. Uh, there is a huge gap uh, still remains between China and the, the more developed countries in terms of how law is enforced. Okay. And, and also, uh, uh, you know, in terms of freedom, uh, you know, China, uh, China believes that we should strike a balance between stability and freedom, personal freedom. Okay. And China believes that it's, China happens to be in a dynamic changing period, uh, transitional period. Okay. Um, there are a lot of destabilizing forces. Uh, people are unhappy for all kinds of reasons because the things are changing so fast. Okay. Um, so Chinese government believes that we need to make sure that the society is stable so that our economy can, can grow and our reforms can continue. Okay. So stability is necessary for these things to happen. At the same time, of course, Chinese government also believe, also recognizes that there is a growing demand for, <laughs> for individual, uh, you know, voices. Uh, but in the Chinese uh, case, uh, the Chinese government apparently uh, gives more emphasis on uh, stability uh, and harmony uh, instead of uh, individual freedom. And this runs into direct conflict with uh, some people's view of China, uh, some people's expectation of China. Okay. Um, so, um, but I think uh, you know Chinese believe that as we move on, move move on, we will become more liberal, more democratic. Uh, there, there are ups and downs. Uh, in this kind of progress, if you look at the past 40 some years, China has become much more liberal society than before. Uh, the recent reversal to some extent uh, has something to do with uh, uh, the political dynamics here, uh, but I think the general trend has not changed. But the people in the West, uh, especially the US, have interpreted this as an uh, irreversible trend or reversal of Chinese politics. Uh, and, uh, and they believe that uh, China is advocating very different set of values uh, from, from the West. I think that's not true. Okay. Um, well, it will, you cannot uh, assure anybody, <laughs> only time uh, we'll, we'll tell <laughs> uh, what, what will happen in, 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 in the future. But I think, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the broader trend uh, is still there. Uh, recently, we just, uh, the NPC, the Chinese uh, legislator, uh, just passed a, a code of law. Uh, so basically, uh, <laughs> the, they put together laws that protect uh, people's uh, various kinds of uh, interests. Uh, and this is uh, supposed to be uh, more uh, effectively implemented in, in the days to come. So China, Chinese uh, society will be regulated more by, by laws rather than by individual uh, officials' opinions. And this is in the general direction of rule of law. Uh, that has not change, and that will not change, I think, in the long run. Yeah, um, the, you, you mean about the civil code that has been uh, um, yeah, the civil code. By, yeah. Yes, yeah, this is certainly a very important step forward. Uh, but, uh, Chinguo, there is something that, um, nonetheless, it's evident something that, in like in the in the path in the course in the de uh, development of Central American relations, something um, uh, say 
degenerated, like this, the process that, uh, if you look at the process from the end of 1970s, or 1970s, as you say, you know, uh, uh, we can say, we can see like a, a positive trend, but in the last few years, something started like uh, um, stop working, I would say. So there was a sort of discont historical discontinuity, it's evident. So the, the, we would like to know, would be interesting to know what you think is the, the origin of this, um, of this new trend, uh, of this new, you say, uh, tension that is uh, more influencing more and more uh, South American relations. When did it start? And what is the, the all, I mean, you, can you identify like some specific steps taken maybe by China or by the US, you know, uh, that somehow um, uh, influence these, uh, uh, the previous trend to the point to change its course? Well, uh, the changes in China uh, uh, has never been, uh, you know, uh, linear, uh, linear <laughs> in the past, uh, in the Chinese politics, that's never been linear. We have uh, back and forth uh, situations happened before. Uh, this time, uh, I think uh, it has a lot to do with, uh, 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 you know, we, th there is new uh, strength, uh, you know, emphasis on uh, political stability, um, uh, increasing uh, parties' control over the society to make sure that uh, party policies get implemented. And also, uh, you know, people see uh, uh, that there are domestic political, uh, you know, uh, frustrations with regard to how, uh, uh, wealth is uh, distributed. Uh, you know, people, some people complain, or a lot of people complain that the fruits of reforms have not been uh, fairly distributed. So you have very, some <laughs> very rich people, but a lot of people are, their life, the livelihood has not improved that much. So there is also this uh, kind of a, a pressure from below. So the, this, all, the, all these things uh, together uh, have, have uh, uh, somehow, um, you know, changed the political dynamics in China. Uh, and, and there is a greater uh, assertion of, of the party uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, the content or the discontent is uh, put under a certain level and at the same time try to address some of the some of the uh, long-standing problems like growing disparity. Uh, so uh, that explains why you know we had this uh, uh, gigantic uh, campaign to uh, and to uh, eliminate poverty uh, in the last three years. Uh, but the, the, the emphasis uh, uh, on parties' role, uh, the strengthening of parties' power uh, to many people in the West, especially American <laughs> engagement people, <laughs> the value-based engagement people, uh, this is a clear reversal uh, of Chinese uh, uh, direction of reforms. Okay? Uh, and uh, they are worried. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they feel powerless because China has grown stronger, okay. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, on the Chinese side, uh, China's, China has grown a, a, a much stronger than before, but the Chinese mentality has not changed as, uh, in proportion. So a lot of people in China still believe that China is a weak country. Okay. Uh, so when, when China uh, deal with international relations, China advocates, uh, still strongly advocates the principle of non-intervention in China's internal affairs. Okay. And, and, and then uh, in the past, China's uh, advocacy of uh, uh, sovereign rights, sovereignty rights, or non-intervention principle did not uh, uh, matter that much. But nowadays, uh, when China does this, China has the influence. Okay? Uh, 
Uh, so people in the West also feel that China is trying to change the international order by doing so. Okay. They're saying that China is advocating a different <laughs> model <laughs> for international relations. But what actually happened is the chi chi Chinese government feels insecure. Okay. It doesn't want the international intervention in Chinese internal affairs. That's why it, it, it continues with this uh, uh, advocacy of this principle uh, at the international arena. And just because China has more influence and has more resources to persuade other countries to, 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 to work with China uh, on this principle, uh, the people in the West feel that China is changing the international order, the liberal international order. This is very interesting. Um, uh, it's unintended effect of China's rise, um, but uh, it's a uh, uh, you know to to people to some people in the in in the U.S. This is a deliberate strategy of, on the part of China to change the international order, but to the people in in China, this is a this is a lingering you know uh, uh, approach to international affairs. Okay, lingering policy. Uh, you know, when, when I teach my students, I say, look, we have to, we have to rethink <laughs> a, a, a lot of our principles, international <laughs> our foreign policy principles. One is uh, international intervention. Okay, it's a it's a principle that that uh, of the strong. Okay, it's a principle against the weak. Okay. China is no longer that weak. Why? Why do we need to, you know, uh, stick to that principle? Okay, we have to think about it. You know? <laughs> but, but uh, is, you know, uh, but but internally, uh, a lot of people psychologically, I think a lot of people in China still feel that China is quite weak. Uh, we are vulnerable to international intervention. So we need to defend this principle, no matter what. For me, but all these in, have oh, been interpreted as uh, China's, uh, you know, uh, uh, advocacy of a different international order to repl to challenge the uh, the, the, the one uh, uh, that has been there, uh, uh, you know, uh, upheld by the West. I think there is a lot of misunderstanding there. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I would like to, to follow up uh, actually in both uh, the international system and the domestic system that you mentioned uh, quite a lot vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And uh, if I may, I would like to uh, uh, remind you of an article that you wrote uh, almost 15 years ago, uh, Learning to Live with the Hegemon. Uh, fascinating article. Back then, there was... Uh, uh, in the, let's say, five years prior to that article, we saw all kinds of ups and downs in uh, U.S. perception of China, right? Uh, from a, a Clinton administration, which was much more accommodating, to uh, Bush, who initially actually uh, called China a strategic competitor. That was 20 years ago. Uh, we sometimes forget that someone in the U.S. has already uh, coined that term back then. And then, again, a shift by the Bush administration after 9-11 into uh, viewing China as a responsible stakeholder, someone, to, uh, a state to co collaborate with. Back in that uh, article, one of the things that uh, you were uh, mentioning was that uh, China, uh, I'm, I'm quoting, China badly needs, that was back then, uh, a peaceful international environment. And one of the major reasons for that was exactly the domestic challenges that China was facing. Now, um, clearly, according to what you just said, and as we know, domestic challenges in China are plenty. And there always will be domestic challenges. It's the uh, largest uh, country in the world in terms of population. It, it's, uh, challenges are there. The question is, does China still need that um, uh, peaceful international environment? And how did things change the, to the way that um, 
uh, it's no longer accommodating the hegemon as it were well i think uh, things have changed since then and china has become much stronger uh, in terms of uh, capabilities uh, but i think uh, probably china uh, needs uh, uh, to accommodate the U.S., to work with the U.S. as much as, if not more, so, more so than before. Okay. Um, China still faces a lot of domestic problems. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a situation, you know, uh, we have a lot of people who are still living uh, in a partial, in a sort of developed a developing kind of situation. <laughs> a lot of poor people. Uh, and uh, the country has developed uh, in an uneven way. You know, certain parts of the country are very rich, other parts of the country are still poor and baffled. Okay. And uh, also, uh, our, you know, the, the, dis the, the rule of law the social welfare system, the public health system, all these need to be fixed, okay, to be reformed. Um, and politics too, you know, how, how can we uh, maintain political stability and the parties, uh, uh, ruling parties uh, uh, control, uh, at the same time allow more voices uh, more uh, different opinions to express themselves. Uh, so all these things, you know, we need to uh, uh, spend time to to work on and and to change, uh, and and to sustain a certain level of economic growth is a tremendous task. <laughs> not in the past, <laughs> not only in the past, but also in the in the present and the future. Okay, uh, it's a huge. We have a huge population, uh, so this is the one aspect to it. Uh, we need a peaceful external international environment as much as uh, we ever uh, needed uh, before. At the same time, China has grown into a, a, a superpower in a way. Uh, <coughs> uh, also, <clears throat> a superpower that is integrate, integrated with the outside world. Uh, what that means is uh, China has a lot of interests all over the world. Okay? Uh, when the Syrian case, uh, no, the, the Libya case uh, came, came in, uh, broke out, you know, we suddenly found that we have 30,000 workers <laughs> working in Libya. <laughs> So just imagine how many Chinese workers, Chinese uh, citizens are uh, all over the world. Um, and they're in their life, their uh, prop, uh, you know, interests need to be, legitimate interests need to be protected. Right? And also, more importantly, uh, China uh, as a superpower uh, or uh, future superpower, China increasingly uh, cannot adopt the previous approach to uh, international relations. That was uh, sort of a, uh, a take a free ride approach, okay? a free ride approach. Uh, China has grown too big. Uh, if it takes a free ride, the bus collapses. Okay? So you need to drive the bus now increasingly. So as a result, uh, China, like the U.S., ironically, increasingly like the U.S., uh, can only protect its own interests by maintaining the international order. And how to maintain the international order uh, at a reasonable cost is becoming a big challenge. Okay. Uh, in history, uh, according to Paul Kennedy, Great powers decline, uh, not because of the because they are defeated by the rising powers, but because they are dragged uh, down by the uh, rising cost of uh, 
maintaining the order. Okay? Uh, so China faces the same kind of situation. So you need to work with others. You need to make good use of other countries' resources to help you to maintain the international order to, to help you uh, to, make, uh, to serve your, protect your, in, your own interests. Okay? And the US, whether it's the number one power or number two power, China needs the US resources to help maintain the international order to protect China's interests. I think the same logic applies to the US okay, as far as China is, China is concerned. Okay. We, actually, the best approach for the two countries to, is to make good use of the other country's resources to help maintain the international system to protect their interests at a minimum cost. Okay. Uh, so maintaining good relationship with the US is of greater importance than before, as far as China's national interest is concerned, okay. whether domestic needs or you know uh, uh, international needs, okay. uh, we need to have a good relationship with the U.S. Uh, we need to accommodate each other, but the problem is, uh, uh, you know, people in Washington at the moment are not thinking like this. That's why we have the problem. Yeah. If I could uh, jump in for a second, uh, this is Brandon Friedman. I wanted to, if I could, connect um, the conversation about the US to the Middle East a bit, and you alluded to Libya. Um, and what we've seen over the last decade in our region is, is Chinese interests have grown. Um, and increasingly, uh, we see countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and also Israel, who have been traditional U.S. partners um, in the past, looking east, as the expression goes. Um, and as China's interests in our region have grown, we imagine that we will see more uh, a, a greater China presence. Um, and I wanted, I guess, to get your sense of um, how the U.S. and China could coexist in the Middle East, um, whether um, Increasingly, uh, the traditional, the U.S. is more involved politically and strategically, while China is mostly pursuing its economic interests, whether that uh, pattern of behavior is going to continue or whether we're going to see something different, realizing that it's impossible to know what's coming uh, in the future. Um, and of course, the Belt and Road and, and, and obviously its role in, in connecting China, the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, China's interests, uh, as you uh, put it uh, uh, rightly, have grown in the Middle East. Uh, economic interests have been expanding. You know, China imports a lot of oil uh, from the Middle East. And also China is collaborating with different countries in the Middle East uh, uh, on various uh, other aspects of uh, the economic relationship. Uh, China has been working increasingly closely with Israel. <laughs> um, and, and China has somewhat, somehow managed to maintain good relationship both with Arab countries and also with Israel. Uh, uh, quite amazingly, I, I should say. Uh, this, I think, to some extent has something to do with uh, uh, China's uh, uh, you know, uh, probably a practice of, of maintaining a dis distance in the political and strategic uh, way uh, from the Middle East. A lot of people in China believe that the Middle East is the burial ground of great of superpowers. <laughs> so China has been very cautious not to get involved uh, in, in a political and geo, uh, you know, the military or security sense. But uh, uh, I, I think uh, as China's economic interests uh, expanded with uh, Middle Eastern countries, 
I think eventually uh, China, uh, you know, cannot avoid uh, getting involved uh, uh, anyway. Uh, that, to some extent, explains why China has uh, assigned more importance uh, in uh, in in, in um, monitoring uh, what's going on and also try to play a role, uh, increasing role in the East, in the Middle Eastern affairs. We have a special envoy to the Middle East, uh, unlike uh, ten years ago, uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, we have a Belt and Road, you know, uh, initiative. Uh, you know, increasingly uh, uh, we try to encourage Middle Eastern countries to to get involved, um, and. Uh, I think greater economic influ uh, interest would lead to more, uh, would inevitably lead to more political uh, and strategic, uh, uh, you know, integration. Uh, well, uh, uh, integ integration or in influence <laughs> or a relationship uh, with the Middle Eastern countries. Okay, uh, so. So China probably, well, some Americans have been telling uh, us that, look, <laughs> you, 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 you get a lot of uh, oil uh, from the Middle East. You have a huge stake in the, uh, in the Middle East. You have more stakes in the Middle East. You should get, you, you should, uh, uh, get more involved in the Middle East. Uh, uh, that's their logic uh, a few years ago. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, President Trump's administration probably will say, forget about Middle East, uh, don't, don't come in, <laughs> it's our territory. <laughs> but uh, but uh, realistically, uh, uh, it's inevitable that China will be uh, more involved. But the, the, it's, the, there is always the issue of how to get involved. Uh, China does not want any conflict. China wants to promote economic integration. And, and also uh, some kind of a peaceful coexistence of uh, different countries. As far as Chinese are concerned, China hopes that Israel and Arab countries can stay together peacefully uh, and, and also uh, uh, develop some kind of sustainable arrangement uh, that would uh, you know, make peace and stability sustainable in the Middle East. And that would create a, a, a foundation or condition for more uh, mutually beneficial economic relationship <laughs> for Belt and Road Initiative to be uh, successful. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Chinese uh, wishful thinking, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, we hope. <laughs> well, well, I mean, the, the, talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, the, uh, the two session has uh, just finished and uh, I would, I would like to know whether, because you, you took part in it, and uh, uh, I would like to know whether uh, there was some uh, discussion on uh, the future of the Belt and Road, because, you know, in light of the um, economic slowdown, plus, you know, the COVID crisis, you know, and, and in particular, you know, uh, because of the, the coupling, you know, and the tension with the United States, uh, people are uh, asking whether uh, there will be enough capital to keep sustaining the investment along the Belt and Road Initiative. And for example, like, you know, uh, um, Brandon before mentioned uh, the role of Israel, I can also add uh, Italy in, um, in this picture. Uh, Italy, both Italy and Israel have recently proved to be very much interested in engaging economically more and more with China, but the political price is becoming and the political pressure coming from uh, traditional ally uh, in Washington is is getting higher and higher. So how can China, you know, continue in light of this critical, you know, uh, uh, situation, especially economic situation? Uh, how can China continue to sustain and provide economic incentive for these countries, you know, to maintain interest in uh, uh, connectivity with China in the better world? Well, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative is an initiative. Uh, the Chinese government has been emphasizing this. It's not a strategy, it's an initiative. 
by initiative, uh, China means that it's something that China uh, encourages other countries to join, but you don't have to uh, if you uh, don't feel comfortable. Of course, China hopes that all countries <laughs> are going to embrace this. Um, I think it's true that it's facing some difficulties and challenges uh, with the COVID-19 uh, and also uh, China's own economic uh, uh, development has uh, met some difficulties too because of the COVID-19 and also because of uh, uh, the, the uh, negative trend uh, in economic development uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, in part because of the global COVID-19, in part because of the, uh, the lack of multilateral cooperation uh, on uh, economic issues, uh, in part because of the Trump's policy uh, uh, of American first. Um, it's a, uh, and, and of course, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has also encountered uh, the, the problem caused by uh, Washington. <laughs> People there are very suspicious of what Chinese, Chinese are up to. <laughs> so they think that this is a grand strategy on the part of China to uh, use economic uh, development as a means to expand the, and to control uh, in, a, in a sort of geopolitical sense. Uh, I think they are imagining a lot of things, but um, uh, they have been putting pressures on a lot of countries not to engage in the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay? Uh, that also complicates Chinese efforts. Okay? Uh, Chinese efforts have also been complicated by its own you know, inexperience. Uh, in terms of how to engage in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, economic uh, uh, cooperation with other countries. Uh, this is the first major attempt on the part of China to, to uh, work with a lot of countries at the same time to build infrastructure projects uh, overseas. Okay. Um, uh, the lack of experience also caused a lot of uh, economic problems. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't know how, uh, what you are getting into when you make an investment. <laughs> they become bad debt instead of uh, uh, profitable uh, uh, vehicles. All these uh, uh, put together make uh, the, the, you know, complicate the situation. Uh, uh, complicates the future development of uh, uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, however, I think this is going to continue. Uh, the Chinese government uh, will not give up just because you know, as we put it, uh, pay the tuition for learning. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we believe that this is the right thing to do, you know. Belt and Road Initiative is not a strategy, uh, especially a geopolitical strategy, as uh, some people in Washington ha have imagined uh, and have been, uh, you know, labeled in, uh, all the time. Uh, it is actually uh, uh, some kind of a growth uh, of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of development of the second stage of China's openings and reforms. Okay. During the first phase of uh, China's open, uh, openings and reforms, uh, China tried to ex import capital, technology, and managerial skills uh, from other countries. Uh, China, you know, was short of all these things. But after a period of development, a certain part of China has become more developed like the eastern part of China. They have access of capital, <laughs> they have access of the capacity, access of capacity of uh, production, and they have, uh, you know, 
uh, a lot of uh, managerial uh, experience. Uh, they have technolo technological capabilities and they are in a position to export yeah, uh, these things. Yeah. And uh, they believe that, well, of course, they can do it in the Western part of China, the underdeveloped part of China. But at the same time, they, they believe that, it, you know, Chinese government believes that uh, you know, if, you, if you have BRI, uh, you, can, uh, you can develop new markets, you can create new markets, you can uh, uh, bring more business opportunities, and this would help sustain economic, economic development uh, or, or economic growth in China, especially in the more developed part, part of the country. Okay. Um, so, so it's a sort of a natural outgrowth of China's development at this stage. Uh, the, I call open policy, uh, you know, version two. <laughs> that is the, the export of these stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, it's in China's interest uh, to work with other countries to develop, uh, to create uh, opportunities for development. Uh, um, it's not a strategy of some sort, but but uh, of course, economic development, ultimate the, the e integration, connectivity, ultimately would have political influence, would have geopolitical influence. Uh, but but that's a sort of uh, 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 side effects rather than the main goal of of, of China. I did a study uh, a few uh, like five or ten years ago. I can't remember when. Uh, I tried to find out the rationale of the Chinese government for BRI. I I found there are all kinds of uh, arguments. Okay, some people say this is purely economic. Others say this is pure. This, this can we can add cultural to it. Some people say we can add people to people relationship to it. Very few people talk about strategy. Okay. And then uh, a few years later, I was attending a conference in Pakistan. <laughs> I said, and then the journalist interviewed me. I said, to me, uh, it's a strategy at home uh, for economic development, second stage of economic development. It's an initiative overseas because you, 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 you have to persuade other countries to work with you rather than you can't forcing other countries to work with you. But then uh, the Chinese government continued to insist that this is an initiative, not a strategy. I think, Ori, uh, you have uh, two fingers. Uh, yeah. You want to say something? And then Brandon has a question. Yeah, um, my, my question is, um, as, as uh, both uh, Brandon and Enrico mentioned earlier, the uh, increased uh, interests and uh, uh, let's uh, say uh, collaboration by Italy or Israel or other countries in our region uh, with China prompted criticism from the US and pressure from the US and uh, in some uh, in some elements uh, perhaps we might even uh, see uh, one of those countries um, stepping back a little bit or 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 taking a step back what is the reaction in China to these kind of step backs from uh, these kind of, uh, of of countries? Thank you. Well, China respect the uh, the decisions of uh, uh, individual countries. It's your business. <laughs> um, we have a shared interest. Okay, uh, it's in your interest to work with us on the. BRI, if you think that, if you feel pressured that you have to, to forego your interest for your relationship with another country, I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's against your interest. Uh, if you want to do that, it's fine. But of course, we, if we have a collaborative, uh, co uh, collaborative uh, project uh, and then we are in the middle of it then there there will be economic costs right then probably uh, uh, we have to settle that in a in a fair way okay. 
Otherwise, I think it's a it's a voluntary uh, uh, thing. You know, there is nothing binding unless we are in a contract. Okay. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, China does not force any country to make a choice between China and the U.S. China hopes that no country would have to make a choice like that. Uh, can it's, I ask people it's the people in Washington that are forcing our, our friends to make a choice where, uh, when our friends are not ready, are not, do not want to make a choice. That's the situation at the moment. Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, my apologies for interrupting. I, I wanted to ask a, a, a similar but slightly different dynamic appears to be going on between the US and Iran where uh, the U.S. is sanctions or attempts to um, influence the way other countries do business with Iran um, may be having an effect on China as well. Um, we've seen this in the realm of oil uh, as the U.S. reimposed oil sanctions on Iran following uh, the Trump decision in 2017. And now there's discussion that come October, um, the U.S. will try to prevent uh, countries from uh, engaging in arms deals with Iran as the U.N. arms embargo ends as part of the um, JCPOA Iranian nuclear deal. So I, my, I, I suppose my question is, with respect to Iran, the situation is different. I imagine that there's great interest between China and Iran in doing business together, and the U.S. is making that extraordinarily difficult. Um, and, and so uh, from the Israeli perspective, obviously, uh, we're concerned with the prospect of Russia or China potentially engaging in arms deals with Iran. Um, but I suppose that after October, that will become legitimized by uh, the international system. Uh, so I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that kind of dynamic. Well, China does not want any political instability in the Middle East. We have a vested economic interest there, <laughs> unlike the U.S. <laughs> um, we don't. We want to do business with uh, any country. We want to be friend of any country. Uh, Iran uh, uh, included. Okay. Uh, we don't want to create uh, problems between Iran or Israel or any other country. Uh, China believes that the Iran nuclear deal was a good one. Uh, if we can enforce it, uh, then we can move to the next step. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, for the for for Iranian denuclearization, uh, China support uh, that. Uh, I think it is necessary for us to uh, to make sure that it, it, it is not developed. Uh, nuclear weapons. At the same time, it would have a good, uh, it can, it can uh, have a good chance of, uh, uh, you know, living as a normal country uh, or prosper as a normal country uh, uh, with nuclear free. Okay. So uh, for us to make sure that Iran to denuclearize. We need to put put pressures to on Iran to give up its weapons. At the same time, we need to create an environment in which a, a kind of situation that Iran can prosper as a normal country without nuclear weapons. Okay, you can't just force Iran to give up nuclear weapons, then and, and then uh, just to face a very difficult situation <laughs> of. Uh, you know, uh, continuing threat <laughs> and sanctions. So, uh, so as far as China is concerned, you know, China probably would uh, 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 would do what it can uh, uh, to work with Iran and Israel and other countries to make sure that that uh, uh, a post uh, uh, sanction period 
you know, we can find a way to to do business rather than to uh, to engage in uh, activities that will increase tension. Uh, that probably include uh, not to 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 continue to refrain from selling weapons. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Let's uh, um, try to close um, with um, to with um, talking about uh, the future. Now, um, uh, Foreign Minister Chinese Foreign Minister Wang he recently said that you know sino American relations might degenerate in a, a, a new Cold War. Many scholars are talking about uh, sino American relations being a new form of Cold War. But if we look at the old Cold War, what we know is that in uh, some uh, events, like for example, the Cuban crisis, certainly reinforced the urgency and uh, of uh, strategic dialogue between the superpower. Uh, at the time was United States and the Soviet Union. Now, we are seeing now the uh, uh, crisis in Hong Kong, uh, having probably the potential to become like a major uh, crisis between uh, uh, Washington and Beijing. Do you think, do you think that the Hong Kong uh, situation has the potential to be a new sort of Cuban crisis and which kind of exit strategy, for example, like a sort of new uh, detent, a new dialogue between the two uh, superpowers you can foresee for this uh, uh, so-called new Cold War? Well, China-US relationship has been deteriorating uh, with or without Hong Kong's uh, problem. Uh, the Hong Kong is part of China. Uh, China has a perfect legitimate right to make sure that uh, its national security will not be jeopardized. Um, Hong Kong would continue to enjoy its uh, high degree of autonomy. Uh, but at the same time, Chinese government wants to make sure that, that uh, you know, the, the, the so-called uh, pro-democracy activists, <laughs> some of them are very, uh, are, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, ideologues uh, sponsored by American uh, and other hostile forces outside China. Uh, they, they, you know, <laughs> They are very unrealistic. They destroy things. They hurt people. They, they hurt the, Chinese, the, the Hong Kong's economy. So somehow this has to be, uh, this question has to be addressed. Uh, during the past, uh, last year actually, for more than half a year, you know, there were demonstrations and also violence, a lot of violence and destruction. Okay. That hurt the China, Hong Kong's economy uh, tremendously and also create a constant uh, spot of instability uh, as, uh, as far as China is concerned. Okay. So um, it is against this background that the Chinese government felt that it had to intervene. Okay. Uh, the U.S. may think that Hong Kong is uh, <laughs> the U.S. territory. Uh, actually, this is what Tom uh, Cotton said in one of his recent remarks. He thought that Hong Kong is belong. Hong Kong is uh, U.S. business. Um, but uh, the reality is that China, China has uh, uh, has a, a, a right to 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 make sure that uh, uh, Hong Kong is not a national security liability. Okay. But with, with, with the passage of the Chinese government has vowed that it would continue with the one country, two systems. Um, and uh, I think uh, in the long run, uh, uh, you know, once this uh, uh, problem is resolved, then Hong Kong probably, uh, Hong Kong's economy would, would come back and Hong Kong probably would have a better future. Um, it's ironic uh, that uh, uh, the, you know, the Hong Kong police actually behaved very, in a very restrained way and very professionally. Uh, 
with such large scale demonstrations, so much violence and attacks on people by the extremists among the demonstrators, uh, the Hong Kong police did not fire, uh, did not kill anybody. Or they, they, they fired in, in, in self-defense, but then they did not kill anybody. This is quite amazing. Okay. But instead of uh, praising the Hong Kong, uh, uh, Hong Kong administration's, uh, uh, you know, quite, uh, uh, you know, um, moderate way of handling of the demonstrations. Uh, the U.S. Congress passed this legislation condemning uh, the, the, the Hong Kong administration uh, and the Chinese government. Uh, I think it's not fair. If you look at the current ongoing demonstrations in, Washington, in the U.S., the, how the uh, American police handle the, 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 the demonstrators, uh, I think they are more <laughs> they're, they're, they're more uh, forthcoming uh, to use uh, uh, force uh, than the Hong Kong police. Uh, you know, they, Americans should realize that when, the, when, when demonstrations, uh, the political movements uh, come up, there are extremists uh, who are irresponsible, who hijack the, 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 the purpose of the demonstration. They create disaster, destruction, and violence, and they should be stopped. And uh, I think we should endorse the legitimate demands uh, and the right of them to demonstrate. But at the same time, we should take whatever action necessary to to stop a violence and destruction, especially uh, harming other people's uh, life. Uh, or endangering other people's life uh, in the name of them pro-democracy or pro whatever uh, cause demonstrations. Hong Kong, I think it will, will not be uh, uh, Cuba. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a crisis. Uh, I think the, the, the crisis is, is man-made. Uh, uh, the U.S., uh, the current administration, uh, has this uh, fixated view uh, of China as a as a threat, uh, as a as a country, you know, conspire against the U.S. Okay. Uh, this is uh, it's, so they exaggerate every everything that they see uh, they don't like to see uh, into and, and blow it into great, you know, excessive proportions. And, and Hong Kong too, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a pattern of behavior uh, that's going on for some time. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, ultimately people in Washington, uh, you know, Washington, people in Washington are in a slow emotional stage. They don't, they don't think in a pragmatic way anymore. Uh, but I hope I hope that eventually they they, they will realize that so uh, to to take an emotional approach against China is detrimental to American interests, and they would ultimately come back to a more pragmatic uh, approach in managing the relationship. China will never be uh, just like the U uh, become uh, another U.S. China will be China, but uh, we have to find a way. Uh, we, we have a lot of shared interests and stakes still. Uh, China is uh, like a stakeholder now. Uh, so we need to find a way to work together uh, rather than you know, uh, imagining uh, whatever the other side does has this evil motivation and has a great, you know, part of a, as part of a, grand conspiracy. Uh, we have to find a way uh, to, to recognize uh, our interests uh, and, and try to cooperate where we can and, and, and try to avoid confrontation uh, wherever possible. Sorry. <laughs> if, if, I, uh, if I may, uh, very briefly, concerning uh, yes. Hong Kong, 
Um, I think that one of the reasons that people, certainly in our uh, region here in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean, are interested in what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, also has to do with the fact that uh, it is a, an important gateway as far as, uh, uh, as our economic relations are concerned and so on and so forth. There's nothing new about that. My, my, my very brief question, you know, when I'm teaching my students about uh, China, one of the things that I keep uh, insisting on is that uh, in China often what is much more important is not what the world says, but the domestic issues, the domestic challenges, what China needs to face and do. And in that sense, I, I wonder just very briefly concerning Hong Kong, if you put aside for a moment the US and grand uh, global strategies, th there are issues in Hong Kong that are domestic and has nothing to do with those, and, and uh, you know, like uh, cost of housing and, and all, all of those very uh, immediate concerns, the question of the, the region, the integration of the region, I wonder if you could say a word on, on how these things you think are going to be addressed or are addressed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the internal, the domestic issues of Hong Kong. Well, uh, Hong Kong uh, faces a lot of challenges itself, uh, like uh, uh, polarization. Uh, I mean, the rich are very rich and the poor are very poor. You know, a lot of people are working just to keep them, uh, uh, you know, making ends meet okay, uh, in Hong Kong. They live in very small apartments. Okay? And, and also Hong Kong is facing the problem of uh, how to upgrade its econo economy. Okay? Uh, its economy, uh, as two parts, you used to have two parts. One is a uh, uh, financial center. <laughs> the other is uh, 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 manufacturing. And now basically manufacturing is gone. You know? uh, and uh, so it, it resorts to uh, uh, services. Uh, and I hoped uh, to, to, to have some kind of a, uh, technological uh, component to it, but then uh, so far it hasn't been successful. Okay. So that leaves us to the financials, the role of the financial center. Okay. Uh, Hong Kong's role as a financial center has also been uh, changing uh, to some extent. Uh, in, in the old days, it was the only one in China. Now China has three, okay. Shanghai, Shenzhen. Okay. Uh, of course, they are not as international as, in, uh, as the Hong Kong uh, financial center, but they are growing in clout uh, very quickly. Okay. So uh, China hopes that Hong Kong would, uh, will function continuously as the financial center. It has a unique role to play. Uh, and Chinese government appreciates that. And, and probably would, uh, uh, would continue to support Hong Kong to play that role. Uh, that's why Chinese government is saying that despite the uh, national security clause uh, legislation, China is going, the NPC of China is going to pass. Uh, Chinese government's uh, uh, policy of supporting one country, two system will not change. So China will do whatever it can to help Hong Kong to sustain as a financial, international financial uh, center. Uh, whether China can be successful in doing that depends a lot on the U.S. Okay. Uh, the Trump administration is uh, bent to destroy this, uh, seems to me. <laughs> Actually, uh, in, a, in a rather weird way, because uh, it's in the U.S. interest to keep Hong Kong as an international financial center too. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of investments 
in this part of the world. A lot of a lot of the business goes through the Hong Kong, uh, goes through Hong Kong, and also U.S. has a lot of exports to Hong Kong, uh, much more than Hong Kong's export to the U.S. Uh, so if, but the but this administration is not acting in a rational way, uh, in an economic sense. Uh, it's too influenced by ideology and geopolitical thinking. Uh, you know, people like Pompeo, you know, he, he, talk, when, he when you listen to him talk, it's like we're in the Cold War. Okay. But we are not. Okay. China does not want to get into a Cold War with the US. China wants to maintain a good relationship with the US. China wants to, wants the US to support Hong Kong as a, uh, as a, you know, uh, financial, international financial center. Uh, China wants other countries to support Hong Kong, continue to support Hong Kong as an international financial center. But this administration probably uh, will not do it. Uh, it's unfortunate, but, but uh, to what extent American business, uh, other countries, would support the U.S. Uh, government, uh, administration's uh, the policy. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay, uh, it's against their interests. Uh, but um, uh, maybe in, in 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 a few months uh, we'll, we'll have a different administration, a uh, different policy. Okay. Uh, then we'll we we we'll wait after the initial period of uh, you know uh, uh, hard line policy as in the old days. Uh, we'll have uh, more pragmatism in the uh, in, in 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 the in the government's policy. Uh, I hope pragmatism would would come back. We all hope uh, that the situation will improve. Uh, there is uh, not much optimism around at the moment, but um, we certainly be here uh, to analyze together, debate, talk, and produce uh, indep independent and, uh, and solid knowledge you know, to help people to better understand the evolution of the current situation. Thank you very much, Professor Jia. Thank you very much, Ching Wu. Uh, thank you all uh, for it's a very interesting conversation and I uh, hope to see you soon in Beijing when uh, time will uh, allow. Um, and uh, since then, uh, have a good uh, time and uh, keep helping us better understand the evolution of South American relations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.